All right. What's the Torah portion today? Vayet Kanan, which means ask for mercy. That's what Moses was doing. Moses was wanting to go see the promised land. But as you know, this last Tuesday was what day? The ninth of Av. There was three weeks from Tammuz 17 to the ninth of Av, which are known as what? Dire Straits. Straits. And it is basically a time of mourning. And this is when Israel basically ended up getting a good spanking. Now, how many of you, when you were little, deserved a good spanking and got a good spanking? But then your mom and dad try to console you and comfort you and let you know it's all okay. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You all were good, huh? Well, how many of you have ever had to comfort somebody because something traumatic happened to them? Right? Okay. Whenever something that is emotionally painful happens to someone who we care about, the first thing we want to do is comfort them. Uh, we offer words of consolation and sympathy, especially if, if someone died that they, you know, loved. And with many things in life, we try to look at the bright side, right? That's what we want to do. Try to look at the bright side and try to lift the person's spirits. Okay. Here we had the ninth of off. It was on that day Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first temple. It was on that day Rome also destroyed the next temple. And so what now begins is seven weeks of comfort. And so we are to now comfort Israel. And the first consolation is today. The Torah portion is by at Canaan. And then we have the Hof Torah portion, which is a portion from the Tanakh that goes to the Torah. And it's Isaiah 41 through 26. So we'll be talking about that today. And then you can see next Shabbat is the Torah portion. Ekev, we're still in Isaiah. All of them are out of Isaiah. Notice that every week, the Hof Torah portions are out of Isaiah. And there's seven weeks of comfort. And then what comes the eighth week? Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Everything is starting over. So we're going to look at the Haftor, Isaiah 40, a little bit later this morning. But I want to begin with Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2. Look what it says. is comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Who's he talking to? Non-Jews. Because he wants his people comforted. The only one who can comfort his people is non-Jews can comfort his people. Say, if you're a God, which means he's the God of the Gentiles as well. He says, speak comfortably to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is accomplished. Her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. And this is why the Haftor portion begins with this. Verse, and we're going to come back to it. Now, while we're thinking of them in the Babylonian captivity, because they've been exiled there, look at what they wrote in Psalm 137, verse 1 and 2. It says here, by the rivers of Babylon, that's where we sat down and we wept when we were remembering Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst. And we also know from Matthew 5, 11, it says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Which means if we truly believe that as believers and Israel's been mourning for the last three weeks, it is our job to comfort them. And if believers don't comfort Zion in their time of mourning, who will? Nobody will. As a matter of fact, when we look at Romans 12, 15, now Romans 11 is where it talks about us being grafted into Israel. And then in Romans 12, it says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. So as believers, we're sh we should be mourning over those three weeks of the dire straits with the Jews. And now we need to begin to comfort them over the next seven weeks, pray for them and the likes. 
As a matter of fact, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It says, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? Mercies. He's the God of all comfort. He's the one who comforts us during our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the same comfort how we are comforted of God. All right, so we're supposed to be comforting others. How many have ever received comfort from God? Okay, that's the kind of comfort we're supposed to be giving to others. Now, we know Lamentations was written during the destruction of the temple. And it says concerning Jerusalem, she is weeping sore in the night. All of her tears are running down her cheeks and there's no one to comfort her. All of her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They become her enemies. And then again, in verse nine, it actually says there's no one to comfort her. Then in Lamentations 3, 21 to 23, it says, I call, recall to mind, therefore have I hoped. Surely the Lord's mercies are not consumed. Surely his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so that's what we have to realize. God's compassions never fail. They're new every morning. So with that said, let's begin our Torah portion, and then we'll go back to the Haf Torah. Here is Deuteronomy 3, 23 through 25. Moses is begging for mercy from the Lord, he says. And I said, Lord, the Lord, you have begun to show your servant your greatness, your strong hand, for what God is there in heaven or on earth that can do according to your works and according to your mighty acts. That, to me, sounds like he's really buttering them up. I mean, it really does. <laughs> okay. And he goes, please let me go over and see the good land. That is beyond the Jordan, that goodly mountain in Lebanon. In other words, he's saying, look, I know I can't leave because I made this big mistake, but can I at least follow? Can I, you know, at least go in, not as the leader? And then in 26 and 27, he says, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes. And he didn't listen to me. And the Lord told me, let it suffice you. Speak no more up to me of this matter. You go up to the top of Pisgah. Lift up your eyes and look west, north, south, and east with your eyes, but you're not going over. Okay, so, man, can you imagine? I can see Moses, well, look what all I've done for you. But you know what? He knew he was going to die, and then he'd see the whole promised land. God would take him there in his spirit, and he's going to see it the next day anyway. So he says, just shut up. Okay. <laughs> so look at Deuteronomy 4, 1 and 2. Moses says, now Israel, listen to the statutes and to the ordinances that I teach you to know them? No, to do them. It's not a matter of knowing them. We have to do them. That you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God of your fathers gives you. And then he says this, don't you be adding to the word I command you and don't you be diminishing from it. Because we want you to keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. You know, I think this sounds almost exactly like the book of Revelation, chapter 22. In verse 18 and 19, it says, I testify to every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man adds to it, God is going to add to him the plagues that are written in the book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book of prophecy, God is going to take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. That's pretty heavy. You know, one of the uh, interesting things about Jewish life, uh, the Jews believe the greatest thing they can do is to work for their dad. That's what they want to do, to join him in his work. Now, the kids don't work for dad to become his son or daughter. They work for their dad because they are his sons and daughters. And this is where Christianity gets so messed up on this idea of works. The Jews don't believe they work to get to heaven. They believe they work because they are God's kids and he told them to get to work. Now, this is fascinating. In Genesis 2, 24, everyone knows this verse about a man will leave his father and mother and he is to cleave unto his wife and they will be one flesh. Uh, we know to cleave means to join together, to become one. Well, look at this in Deuteronomy 4, 4. He talks about people who did cleave unto the Lord your God. You're all alive, every one of you. 
So really, we have to understand that word cleaving, especially how do we cleave to God? Do we cleave to God by throwing out everything he says? Not a good idea. So this Torah portion focuses on an important concept of cleaving to God, and it is only by cleaving to God, it says, that we are able to live life or live to the full. Through doing the commandments, that's how we join ourselves. How do you cleave to God? By doing what he says. And I mean, that's what you do. I want to cleave to God. Then do what he says. Uh, when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, you know, may your will be done on earth. We're saying, I'll do your will on earth. We can't ask him to do his will on earth if we don't want to do his will on earth. That didn't even make sense saying that prayer. That's why we take on the commandments. His commandments are take care of the widow, take care of the orphan, take care of, you know. That's really his, his will isn't so much legalism. His will is to be kind, to love one another. That's what it all comes down to. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what his will is. Look at Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. Moses says, I've taught you statutes, ordinances, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do in the midst of the land where you go in to possess. And then it says, keep therefore and do them. And look at this. Keeping the commandments and doing the commandments is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations who are going to hear of these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Oh my gosh, all the nations that would hear of the laws of God and they'd come and see the Jews would say, wow, you guys are so smart and wise. And if that's the case, why are we throwing them out? Because we want to be dumb and stupid, you know? And the other thing I want to point out theologically that's very important that we have to understand what the nations, when they came, and saw this didn't mean they were to go back to China and build another temple. There was only one temple in Jerusalem. 99% of the commandments I can keep, but I may not be able to do. All right, everyone following me. There's a difference between keep and do. Keep means to guard, to protect. I can't do the laws for women. I'm not a woman. I can't do the laws for priests. I'm not a priest. I can't do the laws for farmers. I'm not a farmer. All right, so so many people get all upset about all the laws. What's their problem? They don't have to do them anyway. Okay, uh, and they're going to say, what great nation is there that has a God so near to them as the Lord our God is whenever we call on them? What great nation is there that has statutes and ordinances so righteous as all this law, which I said before you this day? Wow, so many believers think all these ordinances are not righteous. Now look at Deuteronomy 4.9. It says, <clears throat> only take heed to yourself, keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen. And I say, depart from your heart all the days of your life, but teach them to your sons and your sons' sons. All right, this is why it has to go generation to generation. I mean, there are people today that don't even believe the Holocaust took place. And, and it's only been 100 years or less, 75 years or so. And it's like, oh, my goodness, within one generation, people can not believe what happened in that generation. That's why we have to teach our children. Now, look at verse 28 and 31 of Deuteronomy 4. It says, from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him, but only if you search after him with all your heart, with all your soul, and then it says, when you're in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, it's talking about today, now is going forward to the latter days, the tribulation. He says, then you're going to return to the Lord your God and you're going to obey his voice. Because the Lord your God is a merciful God, he will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Do you realize this is one of the greatest verses to fight replacement theology? Right there, it says, God is not going to leave or destroy Israel. He's not going to forget the covenant that he swore to them. He's going to be merciful. And I think this is amazing. Look at Deuteronomy 5, 29, what the Lord says. He says, oh, I wish there was such a heart in my kids that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that I might be well with them and with their children forever. Now, let's see if... With the New Testament, Jesus did away with all those things. 
Well, let's look at 1 John 2, 3 through 6. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. And hereby we know that we're in him. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Now, some Christians I've heard say, well, we don't have to keep the father's commandments. We only have to keep Jesus' commandments. How many of you have heard that before? I mean, that's the most absurd thing because Jesus says, I only do the will of my father. Hello. Okay. <clears throat> now, look at 1 John 3, 24. He that keeps his commandments dwells in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he's given us. Wow. The spirit and the Torah go together. This is my favorite. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments aren't grievous. Oh, you mean I have to give to the poor? What a pain. I have to, I have to give 10% oh, to the widow and the orphan. Oh, that's just so painful. Okay, now here we come to the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Okay, let me show you something here. Anybody can read that? Anybody can read that? Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. But look at the font. This ayin is twice as big as normal. This Dalet is real big. And the reason, some people wonder, why is that made so big? Well, let me show you the reason why. First off, if you take the big ion and the big Dalet and put it together, you get the word for witness. Okay. Now, listen to this. If you were to take, the ion is silent. It's a silent letter right? So is the Aleph. So why can't we just write it this way? It's a Shema. Everyone's going to hear it the same. We just, they're both silent letters. What does it matter? And this Dalet, the top right corner, let's just curve it a little bit and make it a Resh. It's a slight change. What's wrong with that? Well, here's what's wrong with that. That word Shema means perhaps and that word means another. So now we're saying, perhaps Israel, the Lord, our God, there may be another God. That's why no jot or tittle is to change. Even though you may think it make no difference because it's just a tiny corner rounded or they're both silent, it can make a big difference. And in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, it says, these words, which I command you this day, shall be where? Uh, that's, in other words, I want you to want to do this. What I'm telling you isn't to control your life. The purpose is I, I want you to do it out of love. Okay, and teach them diligently to your children. And you know what that word diligently in Hebrew means? It means you have to choose them first. It's like animals that have to chew the food to give it to the kid. Or sometimes with babies, you got to chew the food a little bit to give it to them. In other words, when you diligently teach your kids, it means you have to do what I do, not what I say. Because all so often we tell them to do, but I don't have to do it or do what I say and we're not doing it. So this means you have to incorporate it into your life before you're able to teach someone else. And then it says, I want you to talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, bind them for a sign on your hand, be, have them be symbols between your eyes, write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. What's the Hebrew word for doorpost? Mezuzah. That's why they put a mezuzah on their doorpost. They, okay. And 
uh, here they're nailing it uh, to the house. Some of you may have mezuzahs at your house. But what is inside the mezuzah? It's a scroll of the Shema. The greatest commandment. And you'll see the big iron and the big dollet on the first line. All right. So basically what you're nailing at the doorpost of your house and upon your gates, every time you walk in, you know you're supposed to love the Lord your God. And it's got to be doing it out of love. All right. Now, so what's hung on the doorpost? The mezuzah. Where is God's house? Jerusalem. Okay, the temple is the gateway to heaven. And we know in John 10, 7, Yeshua said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am what? I'm the door. Yeshua is the door. So guess what? Here's Yeshua. He is the doorpost. And there's a mezuzah nailed upon him. Okay, and so, wow, he is the word of God that's in the mezuzah. He's at the gates of Jerusalem. He's being nailed to the doorpost. I think that is absolutely incredible. Now, in Deuteronomy, <clears throat> let's look at chapter 6. This is verse 24 and 25. It says, The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our anxiety. <laughs> for our good always, that he may preserve us alive as at this day. And it's to be righteousness to us if we observe to do all this commandment for the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Now again, I talked about this the other week when I was just highlighting the book of Deuteronomy. But it says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God, he's God, he's the faithful God, and look at this, he keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. That's 60,000 years. It's only been 6,000 years since Adam. And he's keeping love and mercy to those that keep his commandments for 60,000 years. You know, that's a long time. And so, and again, why does he have to show mercy to those who keep his commandments? If you keep them, you don't need mercy. The reason why is what you're saying is my desire is to keep the commandments, but all of us blow it. Yeah. And he knows all of us are going to blow it. But to those of us who repent, there's mercy. But if we don't repent, there's no mercy. That's something important to realize. Um, now we're going to go back to the Haftarah, Isaiah 40, because this is so incredible. I'm going to remind you what verse 1 and 2 was, where he says, Comfort my people, saith your God, speak comfortably to Jerusalem, cry out, her warfare is accomplished, her iniquity is pardoned, for she is received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Well, guess what? In the Gospel of John... Chapter 1, verse 23, Yochanan the Immerser, or John the Baptist, is quoting this chapter. Look at this. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Okay, he's supposed to be crying out to her that a warfare has been accomplished. And then look, this is where it's coming from. In Isaiah Chapter 40, verse 3 and 4. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's the yud heh vav -Hey. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be exalted. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked straight and the rough places plain. What this is saying is the humble will be exalted and the proud will be humbled. Okay, but here's what we need to know. It didn't say this in the Gospels, but he would have completed the entire chapter of Isaiah 40. He'd have continued on speaking at that time. And look at what he's saying. In Isaiah 40, verse 5, it says, and I'm going to give you two different translations. This is the King James, I think. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it 
together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. But you know what's interesting? There's no it in the Tanakh. Okay, it's him. So look at this next translation. The presence of the Lord shall appear. And all flesh as one shall behold for the Lord himself has spoken. And what does John 129 say? The next day he saw Yeshua coming and said, behold, the lamb of God, behold him. And then look at John 114. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Where does that come from? Look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. Here the Lord passed by before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That's where this comes from. Now, I want to make another connection for you. If you go to James, which is really what? Yaakov, Jacob. It says the rich, but the rich in that he is made low. This talks about the mountains, you know, being leveled. He says, because as the flower of the grass, he's going to pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withers the grass, the flower falls, the grace of the fashion of it perishes, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. This comes from the same chapter, Isaiah 40. Look at 6 through 9. What was John crying out? The voice said, cry. And John says, what shall I cry? And this is what he's supposed to cry. All flesh is grass. All the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But here we go. It's the word of our God that stands forever. O Zion, that brings the good news. Get you up to the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that brings the good news. Lift up the voice with strength. Lift it up. Don't be afraid. And say it to the cities of Judah, behold your God. That's what John was saying in the wilderness. Behold your God. And then he goes, behold the lamb. Everything is tying together. And the prophet Isaiah referring to what John was crying out. So you got to make the connection. Even James made the connection. So let's look at John chapter 6, 50 and 51. It talks about Yeshua. And it says, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat and not die. And look what Yeshua says. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eat of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. In other words, I'm going to die. And that is going to be for the life of the world. Now, how many of you know the word of God is likened to food? Right? The word of God is likened to food, not GMO food. And man has been modifying the word of God for thousands of years. And we've been eating GMO food. Think about it. Man, how many you believe the media is biased? So were the translators. Okay. We've been eating GMO food and we just got done reading. We're not to add or subtract from it. We've not only been adding and subtracting, we've been altering and changing. Deuteronomy 4.2, you shall not add to the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish from it. So authenticity is what is the absolute most important we can do. And that's what I really want to get across to you. The, the word of God is food. And we just wish man would quit modifying it, adding, subtracting, altering, changing. And so let's stand. And let's pray. Avina Mokenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much. Being the bread of heaven, being the word of God. 
And Father, just as they are totally trying to edit our food, taking away the seeds so we can't even grow it anymore, and uh, adding things, God, I pray that each and every one of us would want to find the true good word. Father, we just ask that you would guide us and lead us because it's going to be so important in these last days. And Father, I just thank you for all of those who are against GMOing the word of God. Father, thank you for all those around the world, all those right here around the United States that want to sow your seed, not some altered seed. Father, we want to get your pure word out to the world, and we thank you so much for that, for all those who uh, tithe or give offerings or donations uh, to your ministry here at El Shaddai, because we truly want to magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again in Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. All right. We're going to present today. Solomon, as the epitome, the best human king that could ever come, and yet he's the biggest failure. Are you ready? This is going to be a good one. You guys are going to like it this morning. Deuteronomy 8, 11, and 12. Now, remember, this is like 400. How long have we been a nation? A couple hundred years. This was written 400 years before Solomon. They under, they, then they already went through two kings. They went through Saul and David. And let's look what it says. God says, beware that you forget not the Lord your God and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you've eaten and are full and you have built goodly houses and dwelt there. Okay, now look at the screen here, the PowerPoints. Okay, they built Goodly houses. Now, I'm going to keep reading, but you can kind of watch the screen or watch the screen and follow along. And then in Deuteronomy 8, 13, it says, And when your herds and your flocks multiply, okay? Now, of course, you have all these herds and flocks. You're going to need some help. <laughs> but when all of those things multiply, and then it says, and your silver, and your gold, and all that you have is multiplied, and then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. This is why they pray after the meals, not before the meals. Because the problem is when we're totally full and blessed, that's when we forget God. No one comes to God in the good times. They only come to God in the bad times. So he says, when you're totally blessed, the big problem is if you forget me. So now let's watch what happens to Solomon. He wrote this in Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 9, and you can watch the screen as well. He says, I made, how do you know if someone's into themselves? I, me, my, mine. Let's listen to what he wrote. He says, I built me houses. And I planted me vineyards, and I made me gardens and orchards. I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. And then he says, and I made me pools of water. Okay? To water wherewith the wood that brings forth trees. And I got me servants, and I got me maidens, and I had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle and the peculiar treasures of kings and provinces. And I got me, I got me silver and gold and, and, and I got me men singers and women singers, okay? And delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me with all of these great things. Now, does that sound like Deuteronomy? Does that, <laughs> Solomon's totally blessed. He's given wisdom, fame, 
fortune, power, authority, and uh, he forgot God. This is the problem with riches. And then look at, now how many of you know Solomon built the temple for God? And then look at what he says in Ecclesiastes 2.11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, he says, all is vanity. Look at this. Even building the temple, he said, was vanity. Isn't that incredible? And vexation of spirit. And there was no prophet under the sun. So you can see on the screen here, vanity is what he felt toward building the temple. Well, this is why his dad told him in Psalm 127, 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. This shows you he felt like he built the house, which is why he didn't get, give credit to the 200,000 people who did all the work. David had the plans. David gave him the plans by the spirit. David gave him everything. I don't think he lifted a finger to build it. Now, look at this. In Ecclesiastes 2, 15 through 20. Then said, I am my heart. As it happens to the fool, it happened even to me. So why was I any more wise? For there's no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dies the wise man? Just like the fool. Therefore, Solomon says, I hated life. Oh my word. I hated life. Why does he hate life? Look at this. Because the work that is done under the sun is grievous to me for all his vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun. Why? Because I have to leave it to someone else. And who knows if they're going to be foolish or wise. I got to leave it to someone else. Will he be wise or a fool? Yet he's going to have rule over all of my labor, wherein I labored and wherein I have showed myself so wise under the sun. This is vanity. Therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. <laughs> I mean, think about what Solomon was really like. Now, look at Luke 12, 16 and 20. Yeshua was telling a parable, and he said there was a ground of a certain rich man. As soon as he says certain rich man, they're all going to think of Solomon, who brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But look what God said to him. You Fool, this night your soul will be required of you, and then who shall those things be which you have provided? That's exactly what Solomon was whining about. Who's going to get all this stuff I provided? He's totally talking about Solomon here. Unless you make the connections, you don't realize that. As a matter of fact, what did he say uh, in Luke? Yeshua said that the certain rich man said there's nothing better to do than to eat, drink, and be merry. Guess what? Look at Ecclesiastes 8.15. What did Solomon say? Then I commended mirth because a man has nothing better to do under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. Yeshua is directly referring to Solomon. And nobody catches this parable is about Solomon. Well, let's go back to Luke 12, where that parable is about Solomon. And it says in verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They don't toil. They don't spin. And then I say to them, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. It's telling you he's talking about Solomon in the very next verse. How could we not miss that? Now, let's go on. Solomon said the best thing to do was to what? Eat, drink, and be merry. And what does Yeshua say? Don't seek what you're going to eat. 
what you're going to drink. Again, he's referring back to Solomon. Don't be of a doubtful mind, for all these things is what the nations of the world seek after. Your father knows you have need of these things. Rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Don't fear, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Wow. Do you see the connection between this and the Gospels? Referring right back to Solomon? As a matter of fact, Nehemiah, after the temple was destroyed, okay, this has been like six, 700 years since Solomon. Look what it says in Nehemiah. They're trying to come back and rebuild the destroyed temple of Solomon. And it says, in those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and Moab, and their children spoke half in the speech of Ashdod and couldn't even speak Hebrew, but according to the language of each people. So I contended with them. I cursed them. I smote them. I plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, you will not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? They all knew and blamed Solomon. Yet among many nations was there no king like him. He was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then hearken to you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God and marrying these strange wives? Now, are you ready for another shocker? Do you like shockers? Okay, here we go. If you remember... David's dying. Adonijah, from one of David's wives, claims himself as king, right? And so Bathsheba runs to David and said, didn't you say Solomon was supposed to be king? I mean, this is huge. And so let's look at 1 Kings 1, 34 and 35. Let Zadok, the priest, and Nathan, the prophet, anoint Solomon king over Israel, blow with the shofar, and say, God save the king, Solomon. Then you're to come up after him that he may come and sit upon what? David's throne. For he will be king in my stead, and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. Now, this is interesting. Look at 1 Kings 8, 20. This is at the dedication of the temple itself. It says, um, oh, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. This is, this is as David died. This is right after David dies. And Solomon says, as the Lord has performed his word that he spoke, and I am risen up in the room of David, my father, and I sit on the throne of what? Okay, we got the David's throne. We have the throne of Israel as the Lord had promised. And I built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Okay, so this is at the dedication ceremony. Okay, this is at the dedication ceremony. And then <clears throat> look at Jeremiah. We're going 500 years in advance. Jeremiah 22.2. It says, hear the word of the Lord, O King of Judah, that sits upon the throne of... Okay, we got the throne of David and the throne of Israel. Okay. Now, look at this. It says in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 22, and they made Solomon, the son of David, king, what? What? Second time. Okay. What has happened? 11 years have passed. They anointed Solomon king right when Adonijah was trying to become king. And then he didn't start to build the temple until the fourth year of his reign. Then it was seven years building it. So he was anointed right at that time. And then 11 years later at the dedication of the temple, they're anointing him a second time. Okay. It's like the first time wasn't good enough. Okay. So now he wants to be dedicated 11 years later, or when the temple is dedicated 11 years later, they want, he wants them to install him as king again. Okay, we have the throne of David. We have the throne of Israel. Okay, so it's the second time. And anointed him under the Lord to be chief governor and Zadok to be priest. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord. 
what? Not the throne of David, not the throne of Israel. 11 years later, he wants to be reanointed and sit on the throne of the Lord. As king, instead of David his father, and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. Now, if you remember in 1 Kings 4.31, it says, Solomon was wiser than all men, wiser than Ethan, the Ezraite, Heman, and Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Maho, and his fame was in all the nations round about. Okay? Solomon had all the wisdom, all the power, all the fame, okay, all the money. He had all of everything. His fame was where? Throughout the world. So now let's go see 400 years later what the prophet Ezekiel says, or what the Lord says through the prophet Ezekiel. He says concerning Israel in Ezekiel 16, 13 through 19, he's referring to Israel and he says, you were decked with gold and silver. Your raiment was a fine linen, silk, richly woven work. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You did wax exceedingly beautiful. As, uh, and you was meat for royal estate, and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty. Okay, this is talking about Solomon's reign. For it was perfect through my splendor, which I had put upon you, says the Lord God. But you did trust in your own beauty. You played the harlot because of your fame, and you poured out your holidays on everyone that passed by, his that was, referring to the Queen of Sheba, and you did take off your garments, and you made for yourself high places, and decked with diverse colors, and you played the harlot on them. The like things shall not come, neither shall it be. So you took your fair jewels of my gold, my silver, which I had given you, and you made for yourself images of men, and you played the harlot with them, and you took your richly woven garments and covered them. And you set my oil and my incense before them, my bread also, which I gave you fine flour and oil and honey worth. I fed you. You did even set it before them for a sweet savor. And thus it was, says the Lord. Wow. God gives her everything. And then she goes and gives it to whom she loves. That was Solomon. Now, look at this. What else does Solomon do? In Ezekiel 16, 20, 21, it goes on to say, Moreover, you've taken your sons and your daughters, whom you have borne unto me, and you sacrificed unto them to be devoured. And that's what Solomon did. He gave his firstborn to Molech. And that's what all of Israel did for the next 400 years. He says, were your hollow trees a small matter that you have slain my children and delivered them up and setting them apart unto them? Now, does this kind of give you an idea how Solomon's maybe not who you thought he was? It gets worse. If you really want to know what he was like, see what his mother thought of him. All right, are you ready? How many of you have heard of Proverbs 31? Here it is, and I'm going to give you two different versions. The words of King Lemuel. That's a nickname for Solomon. The prophecy that his mother taught him. This shows you how wrong the King James is. Okay, let me give you a better translation. The words of King Lemuel, the burden wherewith his mother chastised him. Completely different. When you hear the prophecy that his mother taught him, it's like, gee, he's spirit filled. He's prophetic and his mommy's teaching him something. Not. It's not the word prophecy at all. It's a mistranslation. It's a burden that his mother whipped up on him. And what is she saying? Well, let's look at Proverbs 31, 2 and 3. What? My son? And what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows, don't give your strength to women nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Now, why was she saying that? It's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. 
You know what Lemuel means? You are a God for them. So she treated Solomon as a God for the others. And since he considered himself a God, he thought he was above the laws for kings. Okay. And so she's telling him, don't, if you're a God, don't act like that. And so now, look at Proverbs 31, 4 and 5. It is not for kings, O oh God, for them. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. I mean, this is, uh, it's, it's really a strange situation here. Okay, but then she talks about the virtuous woman, right? That's a wrong translation too. It's a completely wrong translation. So we're going to look at something here, but I have to start at the beginning. Genesis is where I'm going to start. It says, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the word for life is chai. See? Chai. Uh, you see people with that uh, necklace with those Hebrew letters on it, chai, and it means life. And then I want to show you another word, though. If you take that and you add the letter lamed, it's kayil. And what does kayil mean? Kayil means a force to be reckoned with. The lamed represents authority. It's one thing to have life and be in India on the streets as a peasant. It's another thing to have life and have it to the full and with authority and power. So chayil is a very important word. It means a force to be reckoned with. And then it says in Genesis 2, 8, and the, oh, let me show you this. Chayil basically is also translated as valor. Chayil. Okay? Everybody say Kayil. Not Kayil, it's Kayil. Come on, put the force in it. Kayil. Yeah, it's a force to be reckoned with. Okay, now it says the Lord God planted a garden. You know what? The garden was not part of creation. The Garden of Eden wasn't part of creation. After all of creation, in Genesis 2, it says the Lord God planted the garden. Why? Because he was going to create man out of the garden. And so he, he planted it especially for man. Okay, but look what happens. It says in Genesis 2, 8, the Lord God planted a garden in, uh, eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Adam was not created from the dirt of the Garden of Eden. Adam was created from the dirt outside of the Garden of Eden, and then he puts them in the Garden of Eden after he had planted it. Okay, uh, uh, we just saw that in Genesis 2, 8. Okay, and look at Genesis 2, 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the word for keep there means to hedge about with thorns, to guard, to protect. So here's the Garden of Eden, and Adam was to guard it and protect it like a watchman. Okay, and then now, Genesis 2, 16 through 18, here we see the Lord God commanding the man. Notice the man, why Eve wasn't created when the command was given not to eat of the tree. And he says to Adam, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, Hmm, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people don't understand that word help meet. In Hebrew, that help meet, the word is atzer. And what it means, he needs someone to surround him, to protect him, to be an ally. Wow. Now, that's different. Let me show you an etzer. I need an etzer. Help me. These are etzers. They're protecting the big guy. Okay? 
So there's man and women are to be the ones who surround him and protect him. I think it's interesting in the October 7th war, it was the women who saw the enemy coming, reported it, and the men didn't listen. The women are given the big nose. They can smell, they have the intuition. And so here, I think this is amazing. For example, this is why in a Jewish wedding, the bride walks around the man seven times, surrounding him, protecting him from all others. We find this in Jeremiah 31, 22. Here's one translation. For Jehovah has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall encompass or surround a man. Here's it in another version. For the Lord has created a new thing on the earth. A woman protects a man. She was created to be his bodyguard. Why? Because she would see the enemy coming, tap him on the shoulder and say, oh, honey, here comes the enemy. And then he would go get him. For example, in Genesis 15, verse 2, Abram says, Lord God, won't you give me seeing I go childless and the steward of my house is this Eli Etzer of Damascus. Eli Etzer, that's that word. He was the watchman for God. El Etzer, God's watchman. Okay, now look at Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Here they're trying to build the walls again of the temple after they've come back from the Babylonian captivity. And it says, those who were building the wall and those who were moving material did their part. Everyone working with one hand, his spear in the other. Every builder was working with his sword at his side. And by my side was a man sounding the horn. Okay, so they're watching. They're at Sayers while they're working. All right. Now, here's something I want everyone to think about. Going back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. Here it says, God's trying to find a protector for man, an LEA, uh, an Etzer. And it says, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to all the fowls of the air and to every beast of the field. Okay, so here's, God bringing to Adam lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and dinosaurs. And none of these were good enough to protect Adam. What man wouldn't want a T-Rex to ride around on with the saddle? Yeah, come on, get me. Okay. But none of those were a help meet. In other words, none of those could protect him. Why? Because of the nature of the enemy. It's Satan is the enemy. What good is a dinosaur, lion, or tiger, or bear going to do against a taunt? Nothing. So, um, look at this. Look at Joshua 1, 14. I'm going to put this picture up. Boom. Again. Here in Joshua, you shall pass before your brethren armed all the mighty men of valor and Help them. You know what that says? What's the Hebrew word for valor? Kayil. Kayil. And to help them, what's the word? Etzer. Okay. So valor is kayil, and the purpose is to help be a helpmeet. All right. Now, what kayil means again, it means a force to be reckoned with to have the means, all the resources, an army, wealth, virtue, valor, strength, to possess all that is needed to carry out the task. That's what kayil means. Psalms 108.13, it says, Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that will tread down our enemies. Guess what the Hebrew word for valiantly is? No, not kayil, it's kayil. Oh, okay. Now, Look at Psalm 59, 11. Scatter them by your power. And what's the Hebrew word for power? Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. 
Isaiah 60, verse 5. Because the abundance of the sea will be converted to you because the forces of the Gentile will come to you. And the Hebrew word means forces. Second Chronicles 17, 12 and 13. And Jehoshaphat waxed great exceedingly, and he built in Judah castles and cities of store, and he had much business in the cities of Judah, and the men of war, the mighty men of valor, which means you. Okay, so let's look at this. Kayil means powerful, a force, valiant, valor. And in Proverbs 31, 10, 11, it's not virtuous. It's who can find a Kayil woman. It's not virtuous. Who can find a woman that is a powerful force? Oh, isn't that amazing? And look what it goes on to say. Her price is far above rubies and the heart of her husband safely trusts in her so that he will have no need of spoil because she's like a conquering army on her own. <laughs> now, there are two reasons why men would not want women to be mighty and powerful. Number one, they don't see women as their allies, but their enemy. Or number two, they don't think they even need an ally. They don't see the size of the battle before them or realize the nature of the battle. Now, what does that word et ser actually mean? Here's the word. It's the ayin, the zayin, and the resh. The ayin is I. The zayin is a weapon. And like rosh, the resh is head. Now, in the ancient Hebrew that Moses would have written in, it have looking, uh, looked like this, the eye, the weapon, and you see the head. So what does the word at ser actually mean is she is the one who sees the enemy coming. The very word at ser, help me, means she is the one who sees the weapon man coming. Is that fascinating or what? Yes. You know, and so this is why it's so important that husband and wives work as a team and not independent of each other. So with that, let's stand.